The landing at Anzac Cove on Sunday 25 April 1915, also known as the landing at Gaba Tepe, and to the Turks as the Arbenu battle, was part of the amphibious invasion of the Gallipoli Peninsula by the forces of the British Empire, which began the land phase of the Gallipoli campaign of the First World War. The assault troops, mostly from the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, landed at night on the western side of the peninsula. They were put ashore one mile north of their intended landing beach. In the darkness, the assault formations became mixed up, but the troops gradually made their way inland, under increasing opposition from the Ottoman Turkish defenders. Not long after coming ashore, the Anzac plans were discarded, and the companies and battalions were thrown into battle piecemeal, and received mixed orders. Some advanced to their designated objectives, while others were diverted to other areas and ordered to dig in along defensive ridge lines. Although they failed to achieve their objectives, by nightfall the Anzacs had formed a beachhead, albeit much smaller than intended. In some places, they were clinging onto cliff faces with no organized defense system. Their precarious position convinced both divisional commanders to ask for an evacuation, but after taking advice from the Royal Navy about how practicable that would be, the army commander decided they would stay. The exact number of the day's casualties is not known. The Anzacs had landed two divisions, but over 2,000 of their men had been killed or wounded, together with at least a similar number of Turkish casualties. Since 1916, the anniversary of the landings on 25 April has been commemorated as Anzac Day, becoming one of the most important commemorative dates for Australia and New Zealand. The anniversary is also commemorated in Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Chapter 1 – Background The Ottoman Turkish Empire entered the First World War on the side of the Central Powers on 31 October 1914. The stalemate of trench warfare on the Western Front convinced the British Imperial War Cabinet that an attack on the Central Powers elsewhere, particularly Turkey, could be the best way of winning the war. From February 1915 this took the form of naval operations aimed at forcing a passage through the Dardanelles, but after several setbacks it was decided that a land campaign was also necessary. To that end, the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force was formed under the command of General Ian Hamilton. Three amphibious landings were planned to secure the Gallipoli Peninsula, which would allow the navy to attack the Turkish capital Constantinople, in the hope that would convince the Turks to ask for an armistice. Chapter 1 Section 1 – Intention Lieutenant General William Birdwood, commanding the inexperienced Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, comprising the Australian Division and two brigades of the New Zealand and Australian Division, was ordered to conduct an amphibious assault on the western side of the Gallipoli Peninsula. The New Zealand and Australian Division normally also had two mounted brigades assigned to it, but these had been left in Egypt, as it was believed there would be no requirement or opportunities to use mounted troops on the peninsula. To bring the division up to strength, Hamilton had tried unsuccessfully to get a brigade of Gurkhas attached to them. In total Anzac strength was 30,638 men. The location chosen for the operation was between the headland of Gaba Tepe and the Fisherman's Hut, three miles to the north. Landing at dawn after a naval gunfire bombardment, the first troops were to seize the lower crests and southern spurs of Hill 971. The second wave would pass them to capture the spur of Hill 971, especially Mal Tepe. There they would be positioned to cut the enemy's lines of communications to the Kilid Bar Plateau, thus preventing the Turks from bringing reinforcements from the north to the Kilid Bar Plateau during the attack by the British 29th Division which would advance from a separate beachhead further southwest. The capture of Mal Tepe was more vital and valuable than the capture of the Kilid Bar Plateau itself. Birdwood planned to arrive off the peninsula after the moon had set, with the first troops landing at 3.30, an hour before dawn. He declined the offer of an old merchant ship, loaded with troops, being deliberately grounded at Gaba Tepe. Instead, the troops were to travel in naval and merchant ships, transferring to rowing boats towed by small steamboats to make the assault. First ashore would be the Australian Division, 
commanded by Major General William Bridges. The 3rd Australian Brigade, known as the Covering Force, were to capture the 3rd Ridge from Battleship Hill south along the Sari Bear Mountain Range to Gabba Tepe. The 2nd Australian Brigade, landing next, were to capture all the Sari Bar Range up to Hill 971 on the left. The 26th Jacobs Mountain Battery from the British Indian Army would land next and then the 1st Australian Brigade, the Division's Reserve, all were to be ashore by 8.30. The New Zealand and Australian Division, commanded by Major General Alexander Godley, followed them, the 1st New Zealand Brigade then the 4th Australian Brigade. Only after the 2nd Division had landed would the advance to Mal Tepe begin. The planners had come to the conclusion that the area was sparsely, if at all, defended, and that they should be able to achieve their objectives with no problems, Turkish opposition had not been considered. Chapter 1 Section 2 Turkish Forces The First World War Ottoman Turkish Army was modelled after the German Imperial Army, with most of its members being conscripted for two years or three years, they then served in the reserve for the next 23 years. The pre-war army had 208,000 men in 36 divisions, formed into army corps and field armies. On mobilization each division had three infantry and one artillery regiment for a total of around 10,000 men, or about half the size of the equivalent British formation. Unlike the largely inexperienced Anzacs, all the Turkish army commanders, down to company commander level, were very experienced, being veterans of the Italo-Turkish and Balkan Wars. The British preparations could not be made in secret, and by March 1915, the Turks were aware that a force of 50,000 British and 30,000 French troops was gathering at Lemnos. They considered there were only four likely places for them to land, Cape Hellas, Gaba Tepe, Buller, or on the Asiatic coast of the Dardanelles. On 24 March, the Turks formed the 5th Army, a force of over 100,000 men, in two corps of six divisions and a cavalry brigade, commanded by the German General Otto Lehmann von Sanders. The 5th Army deployed the 3rd Corps at Gallipoli and the 15th Corps on the Asiatic coast. The 5th Division and a cavalry brigade were on the European mainland, positioned to support the 3rd Corps if required. The 3rd Corps had the 9th Division, the 19th Division, and the 7th Division. The 9th Division provided coastal defence from Cape Hellas north to Bulair, where the 7th Division took over, while the 19th Division at Maidos was the core reserve. The area around Gaba Tepe, where the Anzac landings would take place, was defended by the 2nd Battalion of the 27th Infantry Regiment. Chapter 2 – Anzac Cove On the 19th of April orders were issued for the Anzacs to stop training, and for all ships and small boats to take on coal and stores, in preparation for a landing originally scheduled to occur on the 23rd of April. Weather conditions delayed their departure from Lemnos until dawn on the 24th of April. The Royal Navy battleships Queen, Triumph, Prince of Wales, London, and Majestic, the cruiser Bacanti, seven destroyers and four transport ships led the way carrying the 3rd Brigade. They were followed by the rest of the force who were embarked in their own transport ships. Chapter 2 Section 1, First Six Companies At one o'clock on the 25th of April the British ships stopped at sea, and 36 rowing boats towed by 12 steamers embarked, the first six companies, two each from the 9th, 10th and 11th battalions. At two o'clock a Turkish sentry reported seeing ships moving at sea, and at 2.30 the report was sent to 9th Division's headquarters. At 2.53 the ships headed towards the peninsula, continuing until 3.30 when the larger ships stopped. With 50 yards to go, the rowing boats continued using only their oars. Around 4.30 Turkish sentries opened fire on the boats, but the first Anzac troops were already ashore at Beach Z, called Ari Bernu at the time, but later known as Anzac Cove. They were one mile further north than intended, and instead of an open beach they were faced with steep cliffs and ridges up to around 300 feet in height. However, the mistake had put them ashore at a relatively undefended area, at Gabatepe further south where they had planned to land, 
there was a strong point, with an artillery battery close by equipped with two 15cm and two 12cm guns, and the 5th Company, 27th Infantry Regiment, was positioned to counterattack any landing at that more southern point. The hills surrounding the cove where the Anzacs landed made the beach safe from direct fire Turkish artillery. Fifteen minutes after the landing, the Royal Navy began firing at targets in the hills. On their way in, the rowing boats had become mixed up. The 11th Battalion grounded to the north of Ari Bernu Point, while the 9th Battalion hit the point or just south of it, together with most of the 10th Battalion. The plan was for them to cross the open ground and assault the first ridge line, but they were faced with a hill that came down almost to the water line, and there was confusion while the officers tried to work out their location, under small arms fire from the 8th Company, 2nd Battalion, 27th Infantry Regiment, who had a platoon of between 80 and 90 men at Anzac Cove and a 2nd platoon in the north around the Fisherman's Hut. The 3rd platoon was in a reserve position on the 2nd Ridge. They also manned the Gabba Tepe Strong Point, equipped with two obsolescent multi-barreled, Nordenfeldt machine guns, and several smaller posts in the south. Men from the 9th and 10th Battalions started up the Ari Bernu slope, grabbing the gorse branches or digging their bayonets into the soil to provide leverage. At the peak they found an abandoned trench, the Turks having withdrawn inland. Soon the Australians reached Pluga's plateau, the edge of which was defended by a trench, but the Turks had withdrawn to the next summit 200 yards inland, from where they fired at the Australians coming onto the plateau. As they arrived, Major Edmund Brockman of the 11th Battalion started sorting out the mess, sending the 9th Battalion's men to the right flank, the 11th Battalion's to the left, and keeping the 10th Battalion in the centre. Chapter 2 Section 2, Second Six Companies The Second Six Companies landed while it was still dark, the destroyers coming to within 500 yards to disembark the troops, under fire. They also landed at Anzac Cove, but now as planned the 11th were in the north, 10th in the centre and the 9th in the south. The 12th Battalion landed all along the beach. This extended the beachhead 500 yards to the north of Ari Bernu, and 1.5 miles to the south. Landing under fire, some of the assaulting troops were killed in their boats, and others as they reached the beach. Once ashore they headed inland. In the south, the first men from the 9th and 12th Battalions reached the bottom of 400 plateau dot in the north, the first men from the 11th and 12th Battalions started up Walker's Ridge, under fire from a nearby Turkish trench. Around the same time Turkish artillery started bombarding the beachhead, destroying at least six boats. The Australians fought their way forward and reached Russell's top, the Turks withdrew through the neck to Baby 700, 350 yards away. Coming under fire again the Australians went to ground, having advanced only around 1,000 yards inland. Some also dug in at the neck, a 20 yards piece of high ground between Malone's Gully to the north and Monash Valley to the south. Around this time Colonel Ewan Sinclair McLagan, commanding the 3rd Brigade, decided to change the core plan. Concerned about a possible counterattack from the south, he decided to hold the second ridge instead of pushing forward to the third or gun ridge. This hesitation suited the Turkish defence plans, which required the forward troops to gain time for the reserves to coordinate a counterattack. Chapter 2 Section 3 – Turkish Reaction At 5.45, Lieutenant Colonel Mehmet Sefik of the Turkish 27th Infantry Regiment finally received orders to move his 1st and 3rd battalions to the west and support the 2nd battalion around Gaba Tepe. The two battalions were already awake and assembled at Isabat, having spent that night carrying out military exercises. They could not be sent to Ari Bernu right away as it was not marked on the Turkish maps. Colonel Halil Sami, commanding the 9th Division, also ordered the division's machine gun company and an artillery battery to move in support of the 27th Infantry Regiment, followed soon after by an 77mm artillery battery. At 8 o'clock Lieutenant Colonel Mustafa Kemal, commanding the 19th Division, was ordered to send a battalion to support them. 
Kamal instead decided to go himself with the 57th Infantry Regiment and an artillery battery towards Chunuk Bear, which he realized was the key point in the defense, whoever held those heights would dominate the battlefield. By chance, the 57th Infantry were supposed to have been on an exercise that morning around Hill 971, and had been prepared since 5.30, waiting for orders. At 9 o'clock Sefik and his two battalions were approaching Kavak Tepe, and made contact with his 2nd battalion that had conducted a fighting withdrawal, and an hour and a half later the regiment was deployed to stop the Anzacs advancing any further. Around 10 o'clock Kamal arrived at Scrubby Knoll and steadied some retreating troops, pushing them back into a defensive position. As they arrived, the 57th Infantry Regiment were given their orders and prepared to counterattack. Scrubby Knoll, known to the Turks as Kemalayeri, now became the site of the Turkish headquarters for the remainder of the campaign. Chapter 3, Baby 700 Baby 700 is a hill in the Sari Bear Range, next to Battleship Hill or Big 700. It was named after its supposed height above sea level, though its actual height is only 590 feet. McLagan sent the 11th Battalion, Captain Joseph Laylor's company of the 12th Battalion and Major James Robertson's of the 9th, towards Baby 700. Brockman divided his own company, sending half up the right fork of Rest Gully, and half up the left, while Brockman, and a reserve platoon headed up Monash Valley. As they moved forward, Turkish artillery targeted them with airburst shrapnel shells, which dispersed the companies. This, coupled with senior officers diverting men to other areas instead of towards Baby 700, meant only fragments of the units eventually reached Baby 700. Arriving at Baby 700, Captain Eric Tullock, 11th Battalion, decided to take his remaining 60 men towards Battleship Hill, leaving Laylor's company to dig in and defend the neck. Tullock moved around to the right before advancing towards the summit. The 11th Battalion crossed the first rise unopposed, but at the second, Turkish defenders around 400 yards away opened fire on them. Going to ground, the Australians returned fire. When the Turkish fire slackened the remaining 50 men resumed their advance, reaching the now evacuated Turkish position, behind which was a large depression, with Battleship Hill beyond that. Still under fire they moved forward again, then around 700 yards from the summit the Turks opened fire on them from a trench. The Australians held out for 30 minutes, but increasing Turkish fire and mounting casualties convinced Tullock to withdraw. No other Anzac unit would advance as far inland that day. At 8.30 Robertson and Laylor decided to take their companies up Baby 700. Instead of going round to the right like Tullock, they went straight up the center, crossed over the summit onto the northern slope and went to ground. A spur on their left, leading to Suvla Bay, was defended by a Turkish trench system. At 9.15 Turkish troops started moving down Battleship Hill, and for the next hour they exchanged fire. Where the spur joined Baby 700, a group of Australians from the 9th, 11th, and 12th battalions crossed Malone's Gully and charged the Turkish trench. A Turkish machine gun on Baby 700 opened fire on them, forcing them back, followed by a general withdrawal of Australian troops. The Turks had secured Battleship Hill and were now driving the Australians off Baby 700. From his headquarters at the head of Monash Valley, McLagan could see the Turks attacking, and started sending all available men towards Baby 700. Chapter 3 Section 1, Second Wave The 2nd Brigade landed between 5.30 and 7 o'clock, and the Reserve 1st Brigade landed between 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock, already putting the timetable behind schedule. Private Victor Rupert Laidlaw gave this eyewitness account of the landing. The 25th of April no lights were allowed when we got up, we heard the big guns booming and in the distance we could see the battleships shelling the forts. Shrapnel was bursting everywhere and it was making an awful row. We could also hear in the distance the rifle shots, they just sound like, croaking frogs to me. At 5.30 am we were told to fall in quite prepared to transship to a destroyer which we did at 6.15 am we are now on the way to the shore 
a large number of boatloads of wounded are being taken to the hospital ship, I can see one Queen Elizabeth pounding along with her 15-inch guns, the sea is very calm, we landed a few minutes later, and we did get a hot reception, for no sooner did we land than we were exposed to a heavy fire. I am glad to say that we all got under cover safely, we lost a terrible number of men landing as the Turks were quite prepared for us, soon the wounded began to pour in. A large number were flesh wounds. The shrapnel is the worst of all, when night fell our work really began, but although there was a very heavy fire, we were able to reach the trenches and get out the men who had been lying there all day. The country we are fighting in is awful. It is very mountainous and snipers get in among the trees and do their deathly work. The work of getting the wounded away is very dangerous and we can't get stretches into some of the places owing to the steep gullies. The warships keep up a very heavy fire on the forts night and day. The second brigade, which was supposed to be heading for baby 700 on the left, were instead sent to the right to counter a Turkish attack building up there. At 7.20 Bridges and his staff landed, finding no senior officers on the beach to brief them, they set out to locate the 3rd Brigade headquarters. The 1st Brigade was on the opposite flank to the 3rd Brigade and already getting involved in battles of its own, when its commander, Colonel Percy Owen, received a request from McLagan for reinforcements. Owen sent two companies from the 3rd Battalion and one from the 1st Battalion to support the 3rd Brigade. Soon after, Laylor's company had been forced back to the neck and the Turks were threatening to recapture Russell's top, and at 10.15 McLagan reported to Bridges his doubts over being able to hold out. In response Bridges sent part of his reserve, two companies from the 2nd Battalion, to reinforce the 3rd Brigade. At 11 o'clock Swannell's company arrived at the foot of Baby 700, joining the 70 survivors of Robertson's and Laylor's companies. They immediately charged and chased the Turks back over the summit of Baby 700, then stopped and dug in. The two second battalion companies arrived alongside them, but all the companies had taken casualties, among the dead being Swannell and Robertson. By this time most of the 3rd Brigade men had been killed or wounded, and the line was held by the five depleted companies from the 1st Brigade. On the left, Gordon's company 2nd Battalion, with the 11th and 12th Battalion survivors, charged five times and captured the summit of Baby 700, but were driven back by Turkish counter-attacks, Gordon was among the casualties. For the second time McLagan requested reinforcements for Baby 700, but the only reserves Bridges had available were two 2nd Battalion companies and the 4th Battalion. It was now 10.45 and the advance companies of the 1st New Zealand Brigade were disembarking, so it was decided they would go to Baby 700. Chapter 3 Section 2, Third Wave The New Zealand Brigade commander had been taken ill, so Birdwood appointed Brigadier General Harold Walker, a staff officer already ashore, as commander. The Auckland Battalion, had landed by 12 o'clock, and were being sent north along the beach to Walker's Ridge on their way to Russell's Top. Seeing that the only way along the ridge was in single file along a goat track, Walker ordered them to take the route over Pluger's Plateau. As each New Zealand unit landed they were directed the same way to Baby 700. However, in trying to avoid Turkish fire, they became split up in Monash Valley and Rest Gully, and it was after midday that two of the Auckland companies reached Baby 700. At 1232, companies of the Canterbury Battalion landed and were sent to support the Aucklands, who had now been ordered back to Pluger's Plateau, and were forming on the left of the 3rd Brigade. The Canterbury companies moved into the line on the Aucklands' left, waiting for the rest of their brigade to land. However, between 1230 and 1600 hours, not one infantry or artillery formation came ashore. The ships carrying the New Zealanders were in the bay, but the steamers and rowing boats were being used to take the large numbers of wounded to the hospital ship. The transports with the 4th Australian Brigade on board were still well out at sea and not due to land until that evening. The landings recommenced around 1630 when the Wellington Battalion came ashore, followed by the Otago Battalion around 1700 hours, who were put into the line beside the Aucklanders. Next to land, were the two other Canterbury companies, who were sent north to Walker's Ridge to extend the core left flank. 
Events are sure now forced a change in the disembarkation schedule, and at 17.50 orders were issued for the 4th Australian Brigade to start landing to boost the defence. It would take until the next day for the complete brigade to come ashore. The transports carrying both divisions' artillery batteries had been forced further out to sea by Turkish artillery fire, and were unable to land. Chapter 3 Section 3 McLaurin's Hill McLaurin's Hill is a 1,000-yard-long section of the second ridge that connects Baby 700 to 400 Plateau, with a steep slope on the Anzac side down to Monash Valley. In the coming days Quinn's, Steele's and Courtney's posts would be built on the slope. The first Anzac troops to reach the hill, from the 11th Battalion, found that the Turkish defenders had already withdrawn. As the Australians crested the hill they came under fire from Baby 700, but to their front was a short, shallow slope into Mule Valley. When Major James Denton's company of the 11th Battalion arrived at the hill they started digging in, and soon after received orders, from McLagan to hold the position at all costs. At 10 o'clock Turkish troops, advancing from Scrubby Knoll, got to within 300 yards of the Australians on the hill, opening fire at them. Altogether there were two and a half companies from the 11th Battalion between Courtney's Post, Steele's Post, and Wire Gully. They had not been there long before the 3rd Battalion arrived to reinforce them. Chapter 4, 400 Plateau The 400 Plateau, named for its height above sea level, was a wide and level plateau on the second ridge line, about 600 by 600 yards wide and around 1,000 yards from Gun Ridge. The northern half of the plateau became known as Johnston's Jolly, and the southern half as Lone Pine, with Owen's Gully between them. Chapter 4 Section 1, Third Brigade If the landings had gone to plan, the 11th Battalion was supposed to be crossing the plateau heading north. The 10th Battalion, south of the plateau, was to capture a Turkish trench and artillery battery behind Gun Ridge. The 9th Battalion, furthest south, was to attack the artillery battery at Gaba Tepe, and the 12th Battalion was the reserve, with 26th Jacobs Mountain Battery to establish their gun line on the plateau. Unknown to the Anzacs, the Turks had an artillery battery sighted on 400 Plateau. After landing, some of the 9th and 10th Battalion's men headed for 400 Plateau. The 1st 10th Battalion platoon to arrive was commanded by Lieutenant Noel Luti and accompanied by the Brigade Major, Charles Brand. They discovered the Turkish battery in the Lone Pine sector, which was preparing to move. As the Australians opened fire the battery withdrew down Owen's gully. Brand remained on the plateau and ordered Luti to continue after the Turkish battery. However, the guns had been hidden at the head of the gully and Luti's platoon moved beyond them. Around the same time, Lieutenant Eric Smith and his 10th Battalion scouts and Lieutenant G. Thomas with his platoon from the 9th Battalion arrived on the plateau, looking for the guns. As they crossed the plateau Turkish machine guns opened fire on them from the Lone Pine area. One of Thomas's sections located the battery, which had started firing from the gully. They opened fire, charged the gun crews, and captured the guns. The Turks did manage to remove the breech blocks, making the guns inoperable, so the Australians damaged the sights and internal screw mechanisms to put them out of action. By now the majority of the 9th and 10th battalions, along with Brigade Commander McLagan, had arrived on the plateau, and he ordered them to dig in on the plateau instead of advancing to Gun Ridge. Unfortunately the units that had already passed beyond there were obeying their orders to go as fast as you can, at all costs keep going. Luti, Lieutenant J. Haig of the 10th, and 32 men from the 9th, 10th, and 11th Battalions crossed Leg Valley and climbed a spur of Gun Ridge, just to the south of Scrubby Knoll. As they reached the top, about 400 yards further inland was Gun Ridge, defended by a large number of Turkish troops. Luti and two men carried out a reconnaissance of Scrubby Knoll, from the top of which they could see the Dardanelles, around three miles to the east. When one of the men was wounded they returned to the rest of their group, which was being engaged by Turkish machine gun and rifle fire. Around 8 o'clock, 
Muti sent a man back for reinforcements, he located Captain J. Ryder of the 9th Battalion, with half a company of men at Lone Pine. Ryder had not received the order to dig in, so he advanced and formed a line on Luti's right. Soon after, they came under fire from Scrubby Knoll and were in danger of being cut off, Ryder sent a message back for more reinforcements. The messenger located Captain John Peck, the 11th Battalion's adjutant, who collected all the men around him and went forward to reinforce Ryder. It was now 9.30 and the men on the spur, outflanked by the Turks, had started to withdraw. At 10 o'clock, the Turks set up a machine gun on the spur and opened fire on the withdrawing Australians. Pursued by the Turks, only 11 survivors, including Luti and Haig, reached Johnston's Jolly and took cover. Further back, two companies of the 9th and the 10th battalions had started digging a trench line. Chapter 4 Section 2, Second Brigade As part of the second wave, the second brigade had been landing since 5.30, the 5th, 6th and 8th battalions were supposed to cross 400 plateau and head to Hill 971, while the 7th battalion on the left were to climb Pluga's plateau then make for Hill 971. One seventh battalion company, Jackson's, landed beside the fisherman's hut in the north and was almost wiped out, only forty men survived the landing. At six o'clock Major Ivy Blizzard's seventh battalion company, and part of another, were sent on to four hundred plateau by McLagan to strengthen the defence. When the seventh battalion commander Lieutenant Colonel Harold Elliott landed he realised events were not going to plan and he headed to the 3rd Brigade headquarters to find out what was happening. McLagan ordered him to gather his battalion at the south of the beachhead, as the 2nd Brigade would now form the division's right flank, not left. When the 2nd Brigade commander Colonel James McKay arrived McLagan convinced him to move his brigade to the south, swapping responsibility with the 3rd Brigade. Eventually agreeing, he established his headquarters on the seaward slope of 400 Plateau. Heading onto the plateau, McKay realized the ridge to his right, Bolton's Ridge, would be a key point in their defense. He located the brigade major, Walter Cass, and ordered him to gather what men he could to defend the ridge. Looking around, he saw the 8th Battalion, commanded by Colonel William Bolton, moving forward, so Cass directed them to Bolton's Ridge. As such, it was the only Anzac battalion that remained together during the day. Eventually, around seven o'clock, the rest of the brigade started arriving. As each company and battalion appeared they were pushed forward into the front line, but with no defined orders other than to support the 3rd Brigade. At 10.30 the six guns of the 26th Jacobs Mountain Battery arrived, positioning three guns each side of White's Valley. At noon, they opened fire on the Turks on Gun Ridge. Within two hours, half the Australian division was involved in the Battle of 400 Plateau. However, most of the officers had misunderstood their orders. Believing the intention was to occupy Gun Ridge and not hold their present position, they still tried to advance. The 9th and 10th battalions had started forming a defensive line, but there was a gap between them that the 7th battalion was sent to fill. Seeing the 2nd Brigade coming forward, units of the 3rd Brigade started to advance to Gun Ridge. The advancing Australians did not then know that the counter-attacking Turkish forces had reached the Scrubby Knoll area around 8 o'clock and were prepared for them. As the Australians reached the Lone Pine section of the plateau, Turkish machine guns and rifles opened fire, decimating the Australians. To the north, other troops, advancing beyond Johnston's Jolly and Owen's Gully, were caught by the same small arms fire. Soon afterwards, a Turkish artillery battery also started firing at them. This was followed by a Turkish counterattack from Gun Ridge. Such was the situation they now found themselves in that, at 15.30, McKay, now giving up all pretense of advancing to Gun Ridge, ordered his brigade to dig in from Owen's Gully to Bolton's Ridge. Chapter 4 Section 3, Pine Ridge Pine Ridge is part of the 400 plateau, and stretches, in a curve towards the sea, for around one mile. 
Beyond Pine Ridge's Leg Valley and Gun Ridge and, like the rest of the terrain, it was covered in a thick gorse scrub, but it also had stunted pine trees around 11 feet tall growing on it. Several groups of men eventually made their way to Pine Ridge. Among the first was Lieutenant Eric Plant's platoon from the 9th Battalion. Captain John Witham's company of the 12th Battalion moved forward from Bolton's Ridge when they saw the 6th Battalion moving up behind them. As the 6th Battalion reached the ridge, the companies carried on towards Gun Ridge, while Lieutenant Colonel Walter McNichol established the battalion headquarters below Bolton's Ridge. As the 6th Battalion moved forward they were engaged by Turkish small arms and artillery fire, causing heavy casualties. At 10 o'clock Brigade Headquarters received a message from the 6th Battalion asking for reinforcement, and McKay sent half the 5th Battalion to assist. At the same time, the 8th Battalion were digging in on Bolton's. By noon, the 8th Battalion was dug in on the ridge, in front of them were scattered remnants of the 5th. 6th, 7th, and 9th battalions, mostly out of view of each other in the scrub. Shortly after, McKay was informed that if he wanted the 6th battalion to hold its position, it must be reinforced. So McKay sent his last reserves, a company of the 1st battalion, and ordered the 8th to leave one company on the ridge and advance on the right of the 6th battalion. The scattered formations managed to hold their positions for the remainder of the afternoon, then at 1700 hours saw large numbers of Turkish troops coming over the southern section of Gun Ridge. Chapter 5, Turkish Counter-Attack Around 10 o'clock, Kamal and the 1st Battalion, 57th Infantry, were the first to arrive in the area between Scrubby Knoll and Chunuk Bear. From the knoll, Kamal was able to observe the landings. He ordered the artillery battery to set up on the knoll, and the 1st Battalion to attack Baby 700 and Mortar Ridge from the northeast, while the 2nd Battalion would simultaneously circle around and attack Baby 700 from the west. The 3rd Battalion would for the moment be held in reserve. At 10.30, Kamal informed two corps he was attacking. At 11.30, Sefik told Kamal that the Anzacs had a beachhead of around 2,200 yards, and that he would attack towards Ari Bernu in conjunction with the 19th Division. Around midday Kamal was appraised that the 9th Division was fully involved with the British landings at Cape Hellas, and could not support his attack, so at 12.30 he ordered two battalions of the 77th Infantry Regiment to move forward between the 57th and 27th Infantry Regiments. At the same time, he ordered his reserve 72nd Infantry Regiment to move further west. Within the next half hour the 27th and 57th Infantry Regiments started the counter-attack, supported by three batteries of artillery. At 1300 hours Kamal met with his corps commander Isat Pasha, and convinced him of the need to react in strength to the Anzac landings. Isat agreed and released the 72nd and 27th Infantry Regiments to Kamal's command. Kamal deployed the four regiments from north to south, 72nd, 57th, 27th and 77th. In total, Turkish strength opposing the landing numbered between 10,000 and 12,000 men. Chapter 5 Section 1, North At 15.15, Laylor left the defense of the neck to a platoon that had arrived as reinforcements, and moved his company to Baby 700. There he joined a group from the 2nd Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Leslie Moorshead. Laylor was killed soon afterwards. The left flank of Baby 700 was now held by 60 men, the remnants of several units, commanded by a corporal. They had survived five charges by the Turks between 7.30 and 1500 hours, after the last charge the Australians were ordered to withdraw through the neck. There, a company from the Canterbury Battalion had just arrived, with their commanding officer Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Stewart. By 1600 hours the New Zealand companies had formed a defence line on Russell's top. On Baby 700, there was on the left Morseheads and Laylor's men, and at the top of Malone's gully were the survivors of the 2nd Battalion, and some men from the 3rd Brigade. On the right were the men left from the Auckland companies, and a mixed group from the 1st, 2nd, 
11th and 12th Battalions. Once Stuart's men were secure, he ordered Morsehead to withdraw. During a Turkish artillery bombardment of the neck, Stuart was killed. The artillery heralded the start of a Turkish counterattack, columns of troops appeared over the top of Battleship Hill and on the flanks and attacked the Anzac lines. At 16.30 the three battalions from the 72nd Infantry Regiment arrived and attacked from the north. At the same time the Australians and New Zealanders holding on at Baby 700 broke and ran back to an improvised line, from Walker's Ridge in the north to Pope's Hill in the south. The defence line at the neck was now defended by nine New Zealanders, under the command of a sergeant, they had three machine guns but the crews had all been killed or wounded. As the survivors arrived from Baby 700 their numbers rose to around 60. Bridges in his divisional headquarters starting receiving messages from the front, just after 1700 hours Lieutenant Colonel George Braun on Walker's Ridge advised he was holding his position and if reinforced could advance. At 1737, McLagan reported they were being heavily attacked, at 1815 the 3rd Battalion signalled, 3rd Brigade being driven back. At 1915, from McLagan again 4th Brigade urgently required. Bridges sent 200 stragglers, from several different battalions, to reinforce Braun and promised, two extra battalions from the New Zealand and Australian division which was now coming ashore. Dusk was at 1900 hours and the Turkish attack had now reached Malone's gully and the neck. The New Zealanders waited until the Turks came close, then opened fire in the darkness, stopping their advance. Seriously outnumbered, they asked for reinforcements. Instead, the supporting troops to their rear were withdrawn and the Turks managed to get behind them. So, taking the machine guns with them, they withdrew off Russell's top into Rest Gully. This left the defenders at Walker's Ridge isolated from the rest of the force. Chapter 5 Section 2 South The Australians on 400 Plateau had for some time been subjected to sniping, and artillery fire and could see Turkish troops digging in on Gun Ridge. Around 1300 hours a column of Turkish reinforcements from the 27th Infantry Regiment, in at least battalion strength, were observed moving along the ridge line from the south. The Turks then turned towards 400 Plateau and advanced in extended order. The Turkish counterattack soon forced the advanced Australian troops to withdraw, and their machine gun fire caused them heavy casualties. It was not long before the attack had forced a wedge between the Australians on Baby 700 and those on 400 Plateau. The heavy Turkish fire onto Lone Pine forced the survivors to withdraw back to the western slope of 400 Plateau. At 1425, Turkish artillery and small arms fire was so heavy that the Indian artillerymen were forced to push their guns back off the plateau by hand, and they reformed on the beach. Although in places there was a mixture of different companies and platoons dug in together, the Australians were deployed with the 8th Battalion in the south still centred on Bolton's Ridge. North of them, covering the southern sector of 400 Plateau, were the mixed together 6th and 7th Battalions, both now commanded by Colonel Walter McNichol of the 6th. North of them was the 5th Battalion, and the 10th Battalion covered the northern sector of 400 Plateau at Johnston's Jolly. But by now they were battalions in name only, having all taken heavy casualties, the commanders had little accurate knowledge of where their men were located. At 1530, the two battalions of the Turkish 77th Infantry Regiment were in position, and with the 27th Infantry they counter-attacked again. At 1530 and at 1645 McKay, now under severe pressure, requested reinforcements. The second time he was informed there was only one uninvolved battalion left, the 4th, and Bridges was keeping them in reserve until more troops from the New Zealand and Australian division had been landed. Mackay then spoke to Bridges direct and informed him the situation was desperate and if not reinforced the Turks would get behind him. At 1700 hours, Bridges released the 4th Battalion to Mackay who sent them to the south forming on the left of the 8th Battalion along Bolton's Ridge. They arrived just in time to help counter Turkish probing attacks, by the 27th Infantry Regiment, from the south. At 1720, 
McKay signaled bridges that large numbers of unwounded men were leaving the battlefield and heading for the beaches. This was followed by McLagan asking for urgent artillery fire support, onto Gun Ridge, as his left was under a heavy attack and at 1816 Owen reported the left flank was rapidly being forced to retire. At dusk, McLagan made his way to Bridges' headquarters and when asked for his opinion replied it's touch and go. If the Turks come on in mass formation, I don't think anything can stop them. As it got dark the Turkish artillery ceased firing, and although small arms fire continued on both sides, the effects were limited when firing blind. Darkness also provided the opportunity to start digging more substantial trenches and to resupply the troops with water and ammunition. The last significant action of the day was at 2200 hours, south of Lone Pine, when the Turks charged towards Bolton's Ridge. By now, the 8th Battalion had positioned two machine guns to cover their front, which caused devastation amongst the attackers, and, to their left, the 4th Battalion also became involved. When the Turks got to within 50 yards, the 8th Battalion counter-attacked in a bayonet charge, and the Turks withdrew. The Anzac defense was aided by Royal Navy searchlights providing illumination. Both sides now waited for the next attack, but the day's events had shattered both formations, and they were no longer in any condition to conduct offensive operations. Chapter 6, Aftermath By nightfall, Around 16,000 men had been landed, and the Anzacs had formed a beachhead, although with several undefended sections. It stretched along Bolton's Ridge in the south, across 400 Plateau, to Monash Valley. After a short gap it resumed at Pope's Hill, then at the top of Walker's Ridge. It was not a large beachhead, it was under two miles in length, with a depth around 790 yards and in places only a few yards separated the two sides. That evening Birdwood had been ashore to check on the situation, and, satisfied, returned to HMS Queen. Around 2115 he was asked to return to the beachhead. There he met with his senior officers, who asked him to arrange an evacuation. Unwilling to make that decision on his own he signalled Hamilton. Both my divisional generals and brigadiers have represented to me that they fear their men are thoroughly demoralized by shrapnel fire to which they have been subjected all day after exhaustion and gallant work in mourning. Numbers have dribbled back from the firing line and cannot be collected in this difficult country. Even New Zealand Brigade which has only recently been engaged lost heavily and is to some extent demoralized. If troops are subjected to shell fire again tomorrow morning there is likely to be a fiasco, as I have no fresh troops with which to replace those in firing line. I know my representation is most serious, but if we are to re-embark it must be at once. Hamilton conferred with his naval commanders, who convinced him an evacuation would be almost impossible, and responded, dig yourselves right in and stick it out, dig, dig, dig until you are safe. The survivors had to fight on alone until 28 April when four battalions of the Royal Naval Division were attached to the corps dot on the Turkish side, by that night the 2nd Battalion 57th Infantry were on Baby 700, the 3rd Battalion, reduced to only 90 men, were at the Neck, and the 1st Battalion on Mortar Ridge. Just south of them was the 77th Infantry, next was the 27th Infantry opposite 400 Plateau. The last regiment, the 72nd Infantry, were on Battleship Hill. As for manpower, the Turks were in a similar situation to the Anzacs. Of the two regiments most heavily involved, the 57th had been destroyed, and the 27th were exhausted with heavy casualties. Large numbers of the 77th had deserted, and the regiment was in no condition to fight. The 72nd was largely intact, but they were a poorly trained force of Arab conscripts. The Third Corps, having to deal with both landings, could not assist as they had no reserves available. It was not until 27 April that the 33rd and 64th Infantry Regiments arrived to reinforce the Turkish forces. The Anzacs, however, had been unable to achieve their objectives, and therefore dug in. Gallipoli, like the Western Front, turned into a war of attrition. 
The German commander, Lehmann von Saunders, was clear about the reasons for the outcome. He wrote that, on the Turkish side the situation was saved by the immediate and independent action of the 19th Division. The division commander, Kamal, became noted as the most imaginative, most successful officer to fight on either side during the campaign. As a commander he was able to get the most out of his troops, typified by his order to the 57th Infantry Regiment, Men, I am not ordering you to attack. I am ordering you to die. In the time that it takes us to die, other forces and commanders can come and take our place. In the following days there were several failed attacks and counter-attacks by both sides. The Turks were the first to try during the second attack on Anzac Cove on 27 April, followed by the Anzacs who tried to advance overnight 1-2 May. The Turkish third attack on Anzac Cove on 19 May was the worst defeat of them all, with around 10,000 casualties, including 3,000 dead. The next four months consisted of only local or diversionary attacks, until 6 August when the Anzacs, in connection with the landing at Suvla Bay, attacked Chunuk Bear with only limited success. The Turks never succeeded in driving the Australians and New Zealanders back into the sea. Similarly, the Anzacs never broke out of their beachhead. Instead, in December 1915, after eight months of fighting, they evacuated the peninsula. Chapter 6, Section 1, Casualties The full extent of casualties on that first day is not known. Birdwood, who did not come ashore until late in the day, estimated between three and four hundred dead on the beaches. The New Zealand Ministry for Culture and Heritage claims one in five of the three thousand New Zealanders involved became a casualty. The Australian War Memorial has 860 Australian dead between 25 to 30 April, and the Australian government estimates 2,000 wounded left Anzac Cove on the 25th of April, but more wounded were still waiting on the battlefields to be evacuated. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission documents that 754 Australian and 147 New Zealand soldiers died on the 25th of April 1915. A higher than normal proportion of the Anzac casualties were from the officer ranks. One theory was that they kept exposing themselves to fire, trying to find out where they were or to locate their troops. Four men were taken prisoner by the Turks. Private Victor Laidlaw of the Second Field Ambulance recorded in his diary the dangers faced in treating the casualties. The 28th of April I have to report that one of our chaps was killed this day. He was attending the wounded in the trenches and was killed instantly, every day one sees the burials of fallen soldiers, they are all put in one large hole, then the service is held by the chaplain. I was struck this night by a piece of shell, but it only grazed my thigh and didn't hurt at all. I have got the bullets of several kinds of shells, they will be very interesting relics if I get home safely. Several days later he again describes the work of the field ambulance with the many wounded. The 2nd of May in the evening, we had a very hard night's work, our troops had captured a ridge and of course there were plenty of casualties, we were working right through the night, the most cases I noticed were body injuries, though there was a good many fractures. We had a very anxious time with regard to snipers, several times they fired point blank at our squad which were bringing wounded men back to the base, happily they didn't hit any of our corps. This night though, snipers killed one of the 4th FLD. Ambassador Men. The medical service has suffered very severely so far, we don't wear our red crosses now as they only make a target for the enemy. At 6 a.m. we were allowed a little time to get something to eat. It is estimated that the Turkish 27th and 57th Infantry Regiments lost around 2,000 men, or 50% of their combined strength. The full number of Turkish casualties for the day has not been recorded. During the campaign, 8,708 Australians and 2,721 New Zealanders were killed. The exact number of Turkish dead is not known but has been estimated around 87,000. Chapter 6, Section 2, Anzac Day The anniversary of the landings, the 25th of April, 
has since 1916 been recognized in Australia and New Zealand, as Anzac Day, now one of their most important national occasions. It does not celebrate a military victory, but instead commemorates all the Australians and New Zealanders who served and died in all wars, conflicts, and peacekeeping operations and the contribution and suffering of all those who have served. Around the country, dawn services are held at war memorials to commemorate those involved. In Australia, at 10.15, another service is held at the Australian War Memorial, which the Prime Minister and Governor-General normally attend. The first official dawn services were held in Australia in 1927 and in New Zealand in 1939. Lower key services are also held in the United Kingdom. In Turkey, large groups of Australians and New Zealanders have begun to gather at Anzac Cove, where in 2005 an estimated 20,000 people attended the service to commemorate the landings. Attendance figures rose to 38,000 in 2012 and 50,000 in 2013. Chapter 6 Section 3 Sources